And in this last week, starting last Sunday, we have embarked on our summer sermon series. That's mouthful. Um, our summer, summer sermon series, and we'll be studying through the book of Revelation, as Josh mentioned. And if you're joining us, maybe even for the first time in this series today, you came on a great day. You came on an awesome day to dive into this book and into this series because today is the day that sets this whole book, the whole storyline of what's happening through Revelation. Today's the day that sets it into motion. It starts the story. See, last week what we studied was really more like a prelude. It would be like the, the band that comes up and there's the warm-up ba band that comes at the beginning of the concert, right? Well, well today is the start of the main event. This is where the, the real band kind of steps up and the storyline emerges. And this storyline begins today in this book that John wrote with him penning seven letters. Kind of an odd way to start a book. It starts with seven letters to seven different churches in this region of the world called Asia Minor. And if you're curious where that's at, that's where modern, today, modern, the modern country of Turkey would be at, Asia Minor. So these seven churches are in this general vicinity. And I want you to stop for a moment right there, just with that piece of information. Seven letters. And I want to stop and ponder just how powerful these letters are that we're about to read. Because these particular seven letters, there's something special about them. It explicitly talks about in this book that these are not seven letters that John is writing, although he writes down the words. These are seven letters that Jesus is dictating to John to write down right? So I want you to imagine with me. Imagine this scenario. Tomorrow afternoon, you head out to the mailbox, right? You open it up and grab the mail like any other day, and there in your hand, you happen to notice, is a handwritten letter, and it's from Jesus himself, and it's written to you. It has your name on that letter. Whoa, right? What do you think Jesus would say? Imagine what would even be in that letter. Imagine how it would feel to be standing there, holding it, seeing that word on there from Jesus, right? Return address, heaven. I think it would be a mixture of excitement and dread. We'd be locked in suspense. What in the world would this letter say? What would Jesus write to us personally? And chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation give us a bit of an insight and examples of what might be in your letter. See, chapters 2 and 3 are a series of seven letters, and each one of these is sent to a church. And the reason why these seven letters are sent might give us some key insights into what might be in our own letter from Jesus. Because Jesus writes these letters, and there's a pattern, a format that emerges. These seven letters, all seven of them, they share common characteristics between them, characteristics that would likely be in our own letter. These seven letters, they have this same basic format, this template, as it were, and this template has three things in it. An average letter from Jesus in this book would have three things. One of them would be good news. The next thing would be bad news. And the very last thing would be a promise. The standard, the basic format of these letters is good news, then bad news, and then a promise. And this is the full format that we see occur in three of these seven letters. And then if you're reading carefully through these various chapters this week, you'll notice that there are two churches that only have good news, no bad news, 
and a promise. And then there's two churches that have no good news at all. Yikes. Only bad news. And yet a promise. And so as we start to think about this format that these letters take, those moments where they're missing a key part of the format, those are clear moments for us to pay attention. There's something very special about that church, either good or bad. And this morning, we're going to figure out a little bit more about what this pattern entails, what these letter templates have inside of them, because we're going to look at an example of one of these letters. It just so happens to be the first one, the letter to this church in Ephesus. And this letter has all three parts, the good, the bad, and the promise. And so as we read through this letter, it's going to be in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. As we read through it for you, um, just follow along with that mental checklist, right? They occur in that order, the good news, the bad news, and the promise. So let's read through this letter together. To the angel in the church of Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven lampstands. I know your deeds. Ooh, right? Your hard work and perseverance. Ooh, right? That sounds good. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet... Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So we just saw a quick example with this first letter of all three of those parts. The good news, the bad news, and the promise. And let's dig a little bit deeper and peel back a few of the layers of this example letter. Because after all, when we read this letter from Jesus to Ephesus... John is the scribe. He's holding the pen. But these are the words that Jesus wants to speak to this church. And these words give us insight into the words he would speak to us. So let's start in and focus on the first part, the good news, right? How many people out there, when you have, when someone comes up, I've got good news and bad news, which, how many people like to hear the good news first? Yeah, a couple of you. How many, how many like to hear the bad news, right? Yeah, I, I'm more one of those bad news people because then you can, otherwise when you hear the good news, you can't really listen. You're like, oh, there's bad news coming, right? Too bad for you. <laughs> good news first. <laughs> and the good news is actually quite spectacular, right? This is excellent news. The church in Ephesus has good works and good teaching. The Pew Research Group did a poll of the United States, and one of the things that they pulled on was to see um, what people were looking for in their church. What is it that people wanted the most out of their home church? And the number one result, the most common thing that everyone looked for above any other quality was quality sermons, right? Quality teaching. They want to actually know what this book says. This is the thing in the United States we're looking for the most. And good news, this church in Ephesus, they have that, right? As we reflect on this church in Ephesus, we actually start to see that this this is actually more of an exemplary church in our mind. This is a church that works hard and studies the Bible. This is a church that is sharing the truth. This is a church that's standing against heresies and false teachings. This is a church that won't be pressured by politics to cave in on God's word. This is a church that has stood the test of time and a church that has endured hardships and trials for Jesus. In modern times, we would likely hold this church in Ephesus in pretty high regard. 
This is a church that's getting things done right. Good news. But here's the bad news. And it's actually more than probably bad news. It's, it's actually shocking and frightening news. Because for all the good stuff about this exemplary church in Ephesus, this model church, Jesus says he's about to remove this church. He's about to snuff out their candle. This church in Ephesus is on the chopping block. And let's just let that settle for a moment. I mean, in modern times, we could imagine this is the church that would be leading the charge against various political aspects like abortion. This would be the church where everyone is reading their Bibles and the truth is being preached. And yet, how could Ephesus ever have been the church, the kind of church that would be on the chopping block? This must have been a mistake, right? Return to sender. The mailman accidentally gave them the wrong letter. I'm sure of it. But look closer with me at this bad news. Because this is the question we need to figure out. What in the world would justify? What would justify a church like Ephesus being on the chopping block? So let me read that bad news one more time so it's fresh in our minds. It picks up in verse 4. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, despite all those truly great things that Ephesus is doing and that they did, apparently they were missing something absolutely crucial. Crucial. And there are two ways to interpret verse 4 and what it's talking about. Here's the first explanation of verse 4. They forsake the love that was of first importance. The most important love. And that would be the love that they would have for God. Sure, this church in Ephesus, they knew lots of facts about God. They had lots of knowledge about God but they didn't have relationship with God. They were missing the love for God. Explanation one is that the church became centered around religious practices instead of a relationship. But here's another explanation for that statement in verse 4. And this is actually the explanation that many commentators on the book of Revelation, many scholars end up taking this explanation. Explanation two is they forsake the love that they had at first for one another. The church in Ephesus may have been renowned for their teaching, but they stopped focusing on loving one another. They stopped loving their neighbors. See, with either explanation, with either of these two options of interpreting this verse, they missed something absolutely crucial. See, explanation one is where they essentially ignored the first and greatest commandment in the Bible, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Or explanation two is they ignored the second most important command in the entire Bible, and love your neighbor as yourself. Either way, this church in Ephesus might have stood against heresies, and they became famous for what they hated, but they were supposed to be famous for their love. They were supposed to be famous not for what they stood against, but what they stood for. And the Apostle Paul captures a bit of just how important our first love is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'll read it for you. If I speak in the tongues of men or of the angels, but do not have love... I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, 
That person would probably know the book of Revelation pretty well, right? If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardships that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Wow, right? Even if we can understand every single verse in the book of Revelation, if we've got the entire book memorized, even if we have faith that can move mountains, move the mountains out there that we see, even with all of that, if we don't have love, really, we don't have anything at all. If we let this church, this letter to Ephesus, impact us, this letter will change how we approach the book of Revelation. Because I am 100% guilty of this at times, right? And, and I love reading Scripture and diving into it and studying it, but sometimes I can start reading and studying Scripture so that I gain more information about God, right? But as we read this book, our goal of understanding, we should try to understand and come about that we don't just gain more information, it's about gaining a deeper relationship with God. It's not gaining more information about, it's gaining relationship with, relationship with God, relationship with our brothers and sisters around us. An absolutely tragic outcome of this sermon series would be if we studied this book of Revelation together and after studying it, we were able to fully understand every single symbol in the book, right? And then we got into fights and quarrels. We started to cause strife into terrible relationships all because we have the proper understanding of the book. See, from the very first letter, it's the thing we have to keep in the front of our minds. That first love. So already in this letter, we can see that we can gain knowledge and information, but the tragedy would be to forsake our first love. And this letter of, emphasis, uh, of Ephesus, it's already speaking to us and helping to guide us to understand and read the book of Revelation better. Now, I know that we've been looking at this bad news section for a while. We've been in this bad news funk for a few minutes now, but we've almost crossed through it. The light's on the horizon, right? The promise part of this letter is coming towards us. But before that promise gets here, there's one last sobering piece of information I have to give you. One last thing we have to wrestle with. Friends, this letter to Ephesus <clears throat> wasn't an empty threat. These weren't empty words in this letter. The church of Ephesus has been removed. Their lampstand has been removed and their candle is extinguished. The church of Ephesus has ceased to exist. And in fact, where this church of Ephesus once stood, that region now is 99.8% Muslim. The church of Ephesus is gone. Because Jesus wants us to know that above all, he wants us to be known for our love, our love for God, and our love for one another. Okay, we have made it through the bad news. Whew, deep breath, right? You can relax for a minute, lean back, stretch out, get ready. We're, we're going to move into the promise. We made it through the dark part of the, the bad part, the bad news. Now it's time for the last part of this letter. And I'll read the promise part of this letter, verse 7, one more time for you. That way it's fresh in our minds. Verse 7 says, Whoever has ears, 
Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And the old translations of that verse, uh, those, are the, those are the translations I read growing up and I kind of have in the back of my mind whenever I approach the book of Revelation. The old translations of that verse used to say overcome, the overcomers instead of victorious, right? Kind of synonyms. Um, so I'd say to the one who overcomes. And so in my mind, I always called these the overcomer promises, right? The overcomer promises at the end of all these letters. And these promises are, the, are to the one who is victorious, but there's something peculiar about verse 7. Let's look closer at it. Because what we saw in verse 7 is that whoever, who is it that he's making these promises to? Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Not just the church in Ephesus, that would be one church, to all the churches, to whoever has ears. These promises are made universally. And these promises are even more peculiar when we start to look closer, because what exactly are in these promises? Well, we saw the one that we just read, and it, and it talked about how we'll eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. That was the promise. Okay, what about other promises? In Smyrna, the one who is victorious will not be hurt by the second death. Hmm. How about Sardis? The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white, and I will never blot out the name of the person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Okay. Philadelphia says this, The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I also write on them my new name. See, these overcomer promises, they describe how God's holy city will come down out of heaven, how we will be resurrected from the dead, never to die again, how we will eat from the tree of life in paradise beside God. See, God is making these promises, and he's making these promises to us, to everyone who reads this book, whoever has ears. And these promises, these seven letters with these seven promises, they set into motion the whole storyline of the book of Revelation. Because God's power, God's overcomer promises, is that he will make things right. God will make things right. Death, suffering, sickness, and evil will not have the last word. And the whole rest of this book of Revelation is God revealing that he has a plan. That these promises that he's made, that he is faithful to them that he will stick with his word, and that we can trust him. See, it's going to be a wild ride as we read through this book of Revelation and as we get glimpses at God's plan. But you know how this book of Revelation ends? It ends with this. The book of Revelation culminates and ends with every single word of those overcomer promises being fulfilled. That's the end. The end is when the promises made to each one of us will be fulfilled. What a powerful book. And it's why having this tree of life right here from the very beginning is such a powerful symbol for us. Because this is how the book starts. It says, this is the promise I'm making to you. And then through this book, as we go through the pages, it reveals how God is going to bring that about and how he's going to be faithful to that promise he's making to us. Now, I know some of us, as we think about this, 
this letter that's been written to Ephesus. And as we kind of think back to what it would have been like imagining walking up to that mailbox, that, that letter in our hand that's addressed to us, after reading this example to Ephesus, there might be excitement in our mind as we, as we go back and think about that moment of what it would be like to have a letter from Jesus written to us. And for some of us, there might be more dread now more than ever. And I know that some of us would be afraid to open that letter. Afraid to hear the truth. We might be hoping that there is good news in that letter at all. What if we're one of those people that just has no good news? Some of the letters that Jesus writes to the churches, there is no good news. It's a reality. Yikes! Would you like bad news or bad news, right? That's not a good choice. If Jesus sent us a letter, would you be terrified to open it? If that's you, I want you to recognize something about these seven letters. Jesus writes these letters to the churches, and in particular, he writes to churches that are broken, messed up, and dysfunctional, right? In fact, there's some churches, two churches, that he doesn't have a single good thing to say about these churches. There's not a single good thing that even comes to mind. But you know how every single one of these letters ends? regardless of how messed up the people are, every single one of these letters ends with the promise. Every single letter includes that promise and that hope that we can still overcome. Even a broken and backwards church like Laodicea, where Jesus couldn't say one good thing about this church, and yet, even to that person, with not one good thing, Jesus would include this in their letter. In Revelation 3.19, he says, Those whom I love, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Even the worst church gets this promise. And regardless of where you are at, you get that promise too. This promise is not based on how much good stuff you've done. In fact, Ephesus made that mistake, right? They did tons of good stuff. And that's not what this promise is based on. And as we'll see next week, we will not be the one who overcomes. We, we, we aren't the one who are victorious by our own strength. See, what the book of Revelation reveals to us is that Jesus is actually going to fight on our behalf. He's going to win the victory for us. He will overcome on our behalf. And he knocks on the door, and he offers to share his victory with us. If Jesus has knocked on the door of your heart, and you want to share with his victory, if you want to take part in what these promises entail, I'm going to pray and close this service, and then we'll have one last song as the worship band comes up. And during that last song, you all are dismissed, but I'm going to be over in that corner over there by the sound booth. And if Jesus is knocking on your heart, and you want to take part in these promises, today can be that day. I would love to pray with you, Come back there during one of those, the, that last song, and we'll pray together. All right. Would you close your, would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father, we just, we read through these letters to the seven churches, and we realize that there are a lot of things in there that, that speak to us. These churches 
a thousand years ago were just as messed up as, as we are today sometimes. And yet, despite how messed up they were or how great they were or, or what their actions were, you made them this promise. To him who overcomes, they'll get to be with you. They'll get to see that real tree of life. And Father, this book is the book that reveals how you're going to do that. From these letters, you set ahead of us what the destination looks like, where it is we're going, and now it's just a matter of, of kind of discovering how the path winds that takes us there. Father, would you help us today? If we haven't made that, that choice, if we, if we don't know what our destination is, would you put it on our hearts today that today can be the day that we can know? Father, as we close in this last song, we thank you for the ways that you have used this book to speak to us, and we just pray that you would continue to speak to us through this week as we continue to read it together, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.